just smile. <laughs> just smile. Okay, so we're going to kick off. Welcome to this uh, launch of the Handbook for Transnational Activism, uh, which has gone online today. Um, it is a handbook which, as it says in the name, seeks to help people attempting to do transnational activism. And I'm tempted to say it's an experimental handbook. Uh, that's because if forms of activism across borders have existed, uh, since borders have existed, um, our contemporary challenges are many of them very evidently um, transnational in scope. Um, obvious examples are climate, nuclear disarmament, migration, when we think seriously about almost any issue, uh, also those touching on workers' rights, the care economy, housing, um, political rights, many, many of them have trans-border uh, characteristics. We're all aware of that. And there's been many attempts uh, over the past decade, 15 years in responses to, if we think of the economic crisis, the climate breakdown, uh, the pandemic, what's called the migration crisis, many attempts to mobilize across borders, uh, but we've had different uh, degrees of success. And so experimental handbook is a way of saying uh, that transnational activism is something we don't know how to do uh, to a satisfactory level. Um, and we need to, my son is wanting to intervene. <laughs> the, um, the, we need to look at what worked and look at what didn't work and learn from those different examples, but also be experimental and open in our thinking about the topics themselves. Um, what that means is, let me let me uh, introduce my son, Octav. Look, come and if you want to join in, come and speak. You see, this is the future of transnational activism right here. Um, he's a little bit young for reading the the handbook, but he's very interested in what we have to say. But he just he just walked out of the seminar. Um, mostly interested in comic effect, I think, at the moment. But it's an example of interventionism. 
the uh, where I was going was to say that transnational activism is both a series of practices, um, but also, and importantly, and I think it's something about European alternatives approach to these matters. Uh, it's important to conceptualize issues that are transnational in a way that permits for transnational organization uh, to be effective. And so in the um, different entries to the manual of transnational activism that have been published today, some of them are more uh, conceptual in their approach. Some of them are very personal examples of, uh, of experiences of activism, and many of them are drawing practical uh, lessons. But it's not a handbook in the sense of a, a list of uh, 10 things you have to do or don't have to do, um, precisely because one of the aspects of transnational activism that is inescapable uh, for us as we're trying to invent it is precisely the need for each transnational activist to take responsibility for inventing and continually revising uh, the form that their activism takes uh, based on um, strategy, circumstances, and learning. This, the, the, the manual itself, the handbook, is a living uh, handbook, which has its first uh, publication today, but it's very much our um, intention to add further entries to it. Some of those will be coming in, in the coming days and weeks, notably some further entries on intersectional feminism uh, related issues and um, anti-racist campaigning. Uh, but over the coming year, we intend to expand the handbook quite uh, considerably uh, as it is used. And we expect people to use it as it were autonomously on, online, including um, everybody who's attending this evening and to send feedback and ideas and um, tell us what, what could be useful to add to it. But we also tend to use it at European Alternatives uh, as part of our school of transnational activism, which will have some uh, new practical uh, in-person sessions, which is something we did before the pandemic in 2019 and we intend to uh, continue to do through 2022 and onwards. And so uh, today is really uh, the beginning of uh, a handbook which will be a living uh, a living document what we're going to do uh, so for the next uh, hour hour and 20 minutes or so is to speak with some of the wonderful contributors uh, that we're lucky enough to um, have had to contribute to the to the handbook and have agreed to participate today and then to have a discussion about um, some of the themes that come up and more broadly the importance of um, this kind of initiative in uh, promoting learning amongst the community of people who are trying to organize across borders. Um, I'm gonna introduce the people uh, one by one um, as, as, as we go around and speak with each of them. Um, the first is Antje Scharenberg, who is someone who's been following, working with accompanying European alternatives for several years. And so, um, and also has been following other uh, many other transnational movements and experiences. And so it's really the ideal person to have contributed to, to the handbook. So I'm thrilled that um, she's here. And, and I was wanting to ask Antia that in your uh, academic uh, study of transnational politics, you have, have used this uh, term of transversal politics, transversal agency and related it to some other terms that people might be familiar with, like intersectionality as an approach. Um, and so really to, to open up the conversation, I would love to hear what you mean by transversal politics or transversal agency, and how does that relate with transnational and crossing borders um, when we're doing activism? Thank you. Thank you, Nicolo. And uh, I, I just wanted to say as well, thanks. Thanks for having me. Thanks for organizing this. I think um, the handbook is really a, a great resource to have, not just for activists, but also for artists and academics and others who want to act transnationally. So um, yeah, really excited to be part of this and, and, and congrats to everyone involved for, uh, for getting it published today. 
Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, in my uh, PhD thesis, which um, is the result of four years of, of working with and as um, a transnational activists in Europe, uh, I, I talk indeed about the idea of transversal agency. But <clears throat> before, before I get to that, maybe I can just say a little bit about how uh, the thesis has started, because actually, um, before I became formally an academic, I, I was active as um, an activist in the UK, where I lived as a EU citizen during the preparations for and then the Brexit vote. Um, and I was part of a group called Another Europe is Possible, and it's great to see familiar faces here today, um, which was precisely trying to make the progressive remain case, because at the time, Europe was discussed very much as a, as a binary choice, as something you can be in or out. Um, and that was uh, a little bit beside the point if you are interested in um, addressing inequality, because that's something we, we know by today. Uh, certainly, Brexit is not going to uh, address issues of inequality. So um, I was interested then as an activist, but also as, as an ethnographer, as an academic, to explore um, what, what are these alternatives that, that people are, are working on uh, acting across borders in Europe? And one of the things that, that really fascinated me was that um, what, what united uh, the people I worked with was sometimes less a shared idea of Europe, but actually a desire to find ways of acting beyond borders. And that's obviously precisely what, what we're discussing. And I found the, the idea of agency useful to, to think about this. So one of my research participants put it really nicely. He said that uh, we need a pan-European way of having political agency today. Um, so so it's, it's, coming, it's coming from him also, this word of agency. And he gave the example of Greece and he said, uh, today you can be in power without actually having the power to change things. And to me, this was a really, really um, interesting way of summarizing what, what some of the problems are today when we think about acting politically, uh, because he was referring to the case of Syriza, which is a radical left, which came out of a radical left movement in Greece. Um, after the movements of the squares in, in the early 2010s and which managed to get power in Greece, but which ended up having to implement really harsh austerity politics um, due to a variety of actors and circumstances of transnational nature. So, so what we find, found ourselves with and what he described really nicely, I think, um, with this idea of being in power without actually having power to change things, is that, that we find ourselves in a moment where nation states are uh, having less and less power, certainly to, to regulate um, actors of international capitalism, such as big tech companies, um, but also to act in the face of climate change, precisely the challenges Nicolo was, was listing earlier. Um, and I'm not the first to say this, and Nicolo was also saying activists have been pointing to this uh, for a while, uh, not least the alter globalization movement and the world social forums, and so has, have academics. Um, but at the same time, the paradox is that we know the nation state has less and less power to address contemporary challenges, which are transnational, but also the nation state is very powerful when it comes to particularly exercising agency. So for example, uh, the notion of citizenship and, and our paths to enact agency and have a political voice uh, are very frequently still rooted in, in national territories. And so our ways of acting beyond borders, and this is where the idea of transversal agency comes in, and back to your original question, um, becomes more and more important, but it's also extremely difficult in a world where agency is often formalized uh, around national borders politically, legally, but also culturally and socially uh, through the media, various other uh, factors that, that maybe we get to talk about later, what are actually the challenges of acting transnationally. Um, and so I found the idea of transversal agency uh, as an, in an interesting concept to explore what are the ways of acting across borders that we have as activists, as, as people who want to act politically in the face of contemporary challenges. Um, and I found a lot of inspiration in, in the feminist struggle where the idea of transversal politics 
uh, originated to my knowledge in the 1990s in Italy, uh, which is the idea of acting with actors from, from a variety of struggles um, to find commonalities across borders, uh, across thematic borders, but also across national borders. Um, if there are academics that have been using the term transversal to write about citizenship to enact citizenships beyond border European citizenship, for example, is can be this uh, if, if thought in a progressive way. And, uh, and so the idea of transversality is really to, um, uh, to supposed to point to the question, if you want to build power today, what are the borders we have to cross? Uh, and I would say, and this is what I write about in my in my chapter and also in my thesis, um, they are national borders, but they are also the borders of different struggles. And very importantly, uh, I think today we also have to talk about um, transgressing the borders of institutions. And maybe this is something we, we can talk about later when we come to the more concrete uh, examples. <clears throat> Fantastic. Well, thanks, Andrew. I think that's a really good uh, introduction to to, to the topic in a way. And, and there's lots of things in what you said that I expect we'll come back to yeah. um, as we go as we go forward. I wanna, I wanna keep on moving, moving through and, and introduce Eniko Vincent next. Um, now, I mean, you've, you've been involved in all kinds of uh, different political uh, mobilizations and, and, and struggles, uh, but for, the, for your contribution to the um, to the handbook, you, you focused on the issue of housing. And I think that, of course, that's a very pertinent um, issue um, for many people uh, that's, that's somehow come under, under the spotlight uh, in, the, in the pandemic uh, period. Um, many more people have become aware of the radical inequalities in uh, terms of uh, how people are housed. And in your um, contribution, you talk about the necessity of a radical politicization uh, of this topic, I think as a way uh, of, of bringing more people to uh, political activism. Uh, there would be a danger on an occasion like this to think that we're only talking to and about those people who are already politically active. Um, but it seems like in in your article, you're also talking about the necessity of radically politicizing those people who are most affected by the injustices, those who, for example, are experiencing um, housing injustice. So um, it would be fantastic to hear more of your thoughts on that. Eniko. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nicolo. Uh, I'm happy to see you again. You have been visiting Cluj uh, a few years ago. We were discussing about environmental injustice, I guess. Uh, and we have examples still, unfortunately, in the city of Cluj where we met. Um, yeah, but um, what, what Andrea also said, it's, uh, I would begin from there that um, it, um, how, how do we claim that we have power to change something? if the, the, the system and the capitalist political economy is so strongly shaping uh, all of, of the domains of life, including housing, right? So it's, uh, it's hard to believe that uh, if we are going to change uh, a little bit in housing policies here or there, there will be actually a radical change uh, generated through this in the in the in how the system works. So so therefore, um, yeah, I I would I am arguing in in my chapter um, about the need to go behind uh, what uh, a few organizations, including the World Bank. Okay, that's a big one but also smaller organizations as experts, policy experts, are actually trying to do when uh, give consultation to different European institutions, right? In what regards, I don't know, homelessness, in what regards affordable housing. These are the, one of the most recent uh, issues around which uh, the EU institutions started to think about uh, the challenges of housing. So uh, yeah, we are we are wondering at the European Action Coalition for the Right to the City and to Housing, whose members we also are, 
uh, if this kinds of expertise is actually enough, you know, to to handle radically uh, the the issue that is so systemic. And the the the, the question here yeah, it's it's kind of poetic, I guess, because it's. Uh, the answer is uh, no, that's not enough. So what should we do? And um, um, yeah, the, 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 we still do. I mean, we have a, a local movement, it's called Social Housing Now, and we have a national movement block for housing in Romania, uh, being part of that EAC, the European Coalition. So we are still doing advocacy work. Um, because we still feel that we have to put housing on the political agenda and, and also to change uh, ways in which politicians are thinking about it and uh, to, to enforce them in a way, you know, to, um, to handle it as a systemic issue. Because by now, as far as Romania is concerned, you know, housing is considered to be a personal uh, matter, a personal problem, uh, and it's not assumed by the state to, to deal with, with that. So it's, it's left on the person or on the market. So these are the two uh, big uh, um, illusions or political lies, actually manipulations that the state is doing when it's talking about or not talking about housing. Uh, so we have behind behind um, this kind of advocacy work, uh, we, we think that it's it's very important to have a contribution to the mobilization of of people's uh, dissatisfactions and uh, um, negative experiences with this housing, which includes high housing costs, high private rents. Uh, inadequate housing conditions, overcrowded houses, uh, evictions, um, includes uh, the bigger systemic issues of how uh, landlords and even tra transnational landlords and multinational uh, real estate developers are, are all over our countries and actually are enforcing the same trend of uh, of housing politics, right? So uh, transforming housing into um, a domain of accumulation of capital. So that's uh, that's the biggest issue here. And how can how can you change it? Actually, not by advocacy work. I think that yes, it uh, the 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 situation will become more and more critical in terms of housing affordability, for example. Um, and and this, um, yeah, we as activists, we can only try to be present when other social unrests and mobilizations are going on, and 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 have our contribution to 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 that. Okay, so uh, because otherwise, as activists, uh, even if we are acting at the transnational level, uh, I don't see very much how we can be you know, be actors that would have the power to change things. Um, okay, yet again, but I, mm, I don't know, about re returning to the European Action Coalition because that's our mm, transnational kind of structure in, in terms of housing struggles. Um, here I am, how we work uh, as a coalition, it's actually, there are several, uh, several uh, local groups, uh, activists who for several times are themselves are having precarious lives. So it's uh, not so easy to sustain activist work locally and to be consistent and systematic uh, whenever something happens and you have to act and react. So it's it's very little time, you know, for activists to to spend beyond the local uh, communities and and go transnational. So I guess that's one of the problems. Um, the second one is that, yeah, and and for that, you know, what we do, for example, we we, we do organize uh, um, actions at the same period of time in different cities. For example, we have this housing action day 
initiative uh, in the past two years, we did it despite of the pandemic. Um, when, when uh, un under the same political messages, housing, housing is a right, not profit. I mean, all sorts of combinations of these political messages. Um, we, we did that at the same time in, in several cities across Europe. So I guess that's a good, a good way to uh, make clear that uh, we don't deal here only with small local problems, but the systemic uh, um, issues uh, generated by how uh, capital is actually uh, transforming housing uh, into its instrument. Um, then again, um, yeah, sometimes we, we try to address uh, European institutions, but we are not so strong on that. Actually, um, we see how many initiatives um, EU level organizations are, are doing it. Um, but I, I still consider that it's good to, to keep a distance in, in, to, to these uh, EU institutions. Uh, uh, because this actually uh, gives you the opportunity to remain critical uh, to how actually the EU institutions are also a part of this negative story about housing becomes a commodity, housing becomes a tool for capital accumulation, right? Because we know, um, and this is, uh, um, yeah, one of the strongest uh, arguments against uh, EU level activism, for housing justice is that, you know, the EU institutions are saying that there is no EU, um, mm, so, so housing it's not a domain on which the competence. Uh, European Union might have a competence, so it's national level and, and go there and fight. With. But the way in which um, economic and fiscal policies are actually functioning at the EU level, it's having an impact on, on housing, so um, you cannot deny your responsibility in, in what regards housing when you still keep uh, um, austerity politics and the retrenchment of the state from its, its social responsibilities, including uh, the production of public, public housing. Okay, this whole discussion about public housing, social housing, it's one of, of our uh, matters. Uh, and we have different countries um, with different historical traditions in what regards housing regimes. Um, um, but uh, we have also, again, the West and the East, Central and Eastern Europe. We have the former socialist uh, uh, paradigm in which, uh, um, we, uh, from which you can also learn. So it, it's interesting to put together, you know, all these experiences and uh, uh, to, to work on this aim to be uh, critical both towards how capitalism um, uh, deals with housing and how really existing socialism did it. Um, because here in Central and Eastern Europe, you all know we are all confronted with, with very strong anti-communist uh, ideologies still after 30 years. Communism is to be blamed for all the wrongs that capitalism is doing us today. And um, so it's, it's important for us, I'm speaking from that position in a way now, that um, we, we, are, we should be critical about how really existing socialism actually do that. And, and yes, we are, uh, for, for, for public housing, actually the name of our local movement is social housing now. So we, we want more public housing. Uh, we want uh, uh, to rethink what public property means, public ownership means. We want to reconsider how to increase the democratic control, including on public housing from the part of the tenants so that uh, the state should not put the, um, should not be put anymore or yeah, uh, any longer uh, into the service of capital. Um, and yeah, so yeah, basically, yeah, this idea of, of producing more not for profit housing, being that public, social, or other type, it, it's shared across the coalition. 
uh, the socialization of the of housing owned by big landlords. It's again, it seems a, a radical sort. The regulation of the housing markets, because uh, we are seeing um, even if we create uh, more not for profit housing, uh, if the housing markets will continue to function in a deregulated way, I mean, in regulated in the sense of supporting. Um, it's being supported by the state, you know, these, these issues will be, will be reproduced. Uh, okay. Thanks, thanks, Aniko, for this, this really rich um, kind of set of issues. I want to highlight two things that you mentioned, which I think are particularly pertinent for thinking about transnational uh, framing of activism. One is um, the difficulties that a multi-level system of international governance creates. You were talking about the, you know, the European Union tends to say, but this is not our responsibility, it's not our competencies. And then the member states can say, yeah, but we have our hands tied by the European institutions. And so, and this kind of dialectic also plays out with other international institutions, whether it's the World Bank or uh, the IMF or NATO or whatever. Um, and so we're constantly a little bit stuck as, as political actors to identify which who, who actually is responsible and everybody tries to get out of their responsibility. So this is a this is an issue that um, is a feature of our world. Uh, and one of the reasons why you might think that transnational activism is so important is actually to try to hold all of these actors to account in a coordinated way, but it's a bit of a puzzle. Uh, and the second thing that you point, pointed to, which I think is really important, is to remind us that it, everybody is coming uh, from a different historical traje trajectory and a different historical uh, past, or at least a different understanding of the historical past. And so when we start to put uh, activists together or make political arguments beyond borders or across borders, we have to be sensitive to that and also smart enough to be able to piece together parts of a common narrative uh, as well as speak to the differences. So I think those are two really important things we need to keep in mind um, going, going into our discussions. I want to come now to, to Nikita uh, Gregovic and in a way a, a different scale of problem. Um, again, because Nikita, you're, if I understand right, you're in Warsaw, but you are... Um, well, like many Belarusians uh, in Poland, following and very active in uh, the movements in, in, in Belarus, which have been going on for years, uh, but uh, came to uh, uh, international public attention, uh, let's say, around the uh, contested presidential elections last year. Um, I want to ask you, I mean, you, in, in your contribution for the handbook, you both present a little bit the situation in Belarus, but you also have many interesting reflections about the personal um, difficulties or challenges of activists, both in Belarus and the diaspora who had to leave but continue to be active. I, I, it would be great to hear about those more personal aspects, but perhaps be, because uh, I suspect many people have not been following quite what the situation is in Belarus now, um, because in the, in the international media, to the extent that we hear about Belarus, I have the impression it's about the uh, migrants stuck at the border and this attempt to, in a certain way, weaponize um, Afghan and Iraqi migrants uh, um, at the border with Poland. That's a serious situation, but it would, be, it would be great to have an update on actually what the situation is in the struggle against Lukashenko as well. So maybe if you were able to start there, a quick news flash for all of us who haven't been following and then come to the more personal parts that would be great nikita please first of all thank you uh, thanks for having me uh, and well starting at the point when Aniko, where Aniko and Ani uh, finished i guess uh, we have this situation in belarus that um, state elected not to react to what uh, people politicized like politi politicized nation uh, chose to mm, to declare or something, and the state is actively opposing that. So that's another situation, uh, like coming to what what all of you said earlier. But 
in regards on what's happening now, I think the best uh, case is the actual fact of what happened yesterday evening, uh, and that is a death, uh, unfortunate death of Andrei uh, Zeltser, uh, uh, a programmist who, who lived in Minsk and was uh, an activist. And uh, during um, a raid to his house, he, he chose not to uh, be um, arrested uh, and he chose to, to oppose and uh, shot to the KGB agents, uh, killed one of them and was killed uh, in the process. So uh, the situation in Belarus is still very uh, rough, I would say, and very tragic. It is still uh, the totalitarian state I was writing about a few months ago when I was writing the contribution to the handbook. Um, and unfortunately, it probably won't stop until uh, Lukashenko is gone, because obviously, uh, from what he chooses, he, he obviously understands that uh, the moment he lessens the grip, uh, his power is uh, finished. And he, like, from what, what he's doing, from ho all of his choices, we can see that now he elects to somehow, um, I know, force European Union uh, to pay, let's say, with this uh, crisis on the border, with humanitarian crisis that he, he created. Uh, and he's not really thinking about the future anymore. He's thinking only about the present, and that's a big problem. Uh, how to deal with a person who who doesn't care about the future at all. Uh, so to name numbers, uh, se almost 700 uh, people were uh, um, playing political prisoners. It's 670 something now. And as you can hear from the story of Andre, the arrests are uh, happening daily. Uh, and there are a few thousand criminal cases already uh, towards Belarusians. And these are not uh, only towards activists. Uh, most of them are towards um, simple people or even if active people, I wouldn't call them activists as their, I know that their activism would be just knowing the neighbors and contacting the neighbors and being uh, against Lukashenko and against his crimes. So uh, the situation is still very, uh, very serious. And this is why uh, it is uh, still, uh, it, it still needs addressing from the, from the world community, uh, I would say. Thanks. I mean, it's serious, serious indeed. Um, maybe you could speak to the, you know, the, the, uh, in, in your article, you talk about the uh, challenges that the diaspora who have come out of Belarus have in perhaps explaining the gravity of the situation to um, others, even people who may be quite aware of what's going on in Belarus. It's one thing if you've been active in Belarus and you're deeply connected with it, it's another thing uh, to hear about it. And you, you speak quite interestingly in your article about the way this this puts you as, as as a Belarusian living abroad in a difficult situation because you feel a great urgency and other activists perhaps don't feel that to the same extent. Um, so it would be interesting to hear maybe your experiences as someone outside of Belarus trying to encourage other people to be interested in what's going on in Belarus to appreciate the gravity of the situation, the importance of it. Well, most importantly, I would say that uh... It all comes from expectations. A lot of people had some expectations towards uh, Belarus and how things usually happen there, there. Uh, and it all started there. But when things got different, they tried to search for uh, another analogies. Uh, there was a revolution uh, in Kyrgyzstan, meanwhile. So people wondered if it will be Kyrgyzstanian scenario or Armenian scenario or 
Ukrainian scenario and people really needed to to find uh, a narrative in which they they can believe or that they can see a narrative and co coming back to the the idea of people needing a narrative uh, it also happened in Poland that uh, when the general public did not receive the catharsis I would say they were expecting uh, a grand finale and uh, a good ending of the revolution as they perceive for example ending of uh, Euromaidan I would say in Poland uh, which is not that great as we know but uh, it's tragic it's not bad either but it's tragic uh, either way, in terms of narrative, I think that people perceive this uh, Euromaidan revolution as one finished narrative, while uh, in Belarus, Polish people, I would say, Polish public is kind of tired of this subject. And uh, it was quite interesting, both and frustrating for me, to see how this subject of Belarus becomes uh, at some point uh, inner Polish subject. Uh, in Poland there is this Polish-Polish uh, war uh, and Polish people need to be very uh, strongly convinced to, to some oppositions. Uh, so at some point they also try to create uh, two opposing uh, structures to the Belarus subject, which was also very interesting. So uh, I would say that um, coping with people's expectate with general public expectations is a very important task for for activists, transnational activists, especially when we see uh, when I saw the narrative. Uh, w was uh, active in, in Polish general public and the narrative which was active in Belarus, Belarusian uh, general public because it was also very interesting to see how Belarusians become frustrated and tired of the everyday trauma and the traumatic experience of, of, of li living in a, in a state of terror. Uh, so I think that this this can be a subject that we can explore more uh, today, probably. Maybe. Yeah, that's a, that's that's a, that's a great that's a great subject. I I, I want to ask you just one more question because I feel privileged to be able to ask uh, someone who's, who's who's active in Belarus about this. It's it's simply what what would you see as the prospects for uh, overthrowing Lukashenko? How, what is your sentiment? Is there still a strong mobilization in Belarus that is really pushing every day? Have things calmed down and now you don't see what's going to happen for the next coming years? How, how do you feel? Uh, you know, is everybody disappointed? Is, is everybody determined? Do you think that uh, if you had to make, I know it's impossible to make a prediction, but still, how would you see the immediate future? Yeah, sure. I mean, thank you for this question, because I think that it's really important that uh that some people that know what is happening kind of because I'm also like not the best person to talk about it but uh, anyway I have some idea of what's happening and I uh, as, uh, as far as I can see um, Belarusians are really determined and really united still they are also tired and frustrated as I said and they some people wish that they would uh, choose violence uh, in the August of 2020. They are uh, thinking that maybe that was the better choice because that would end the, um, the terror much more uh, faster uh, as they imagine. Uh, it's hard to even cope with such an idea because um, they chose not to use violence and uh, it was also very bold and uh, very important choice for the future Belarus because changing power with violence becomes a habit in societies and changing power without violence can be a really great change.
so that's that's one subject but coming back to what's happening now people are still very determined they are trying to find the ways to to reach uh, one moment as a society again in which uh, everybody will be motivated to go out uh, on the streets again as um, they are afraid to to use their tactics of local um, local defense against regime because it is no longer safe for them as it was in autumn of 2020 let's say uh, but they also realize that if they uh, again find this moment when all the society will be motivated uh, uh, again uh, to go out they will probably overthrow the system as the system is really struggling now because imposed sanctions started to work finally uh, the people are happy to see the economic struggles of the state which is also very interesting because Europeans tend to think that uh, sanctions would uh, um, demotivate people from um, from being active in Belarus as this is state of terror it's different people are really motivated with what they see with how the state is crumbling down um, this is one one side of, 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 of what's happening now and the other side is just uh, just fear I would say because the all the consequences of being anyhow um, active not only opposing but anyhow active uh, every every orga every activist organizations uh, in Belarus are being um, destroyed by, by the government N not only not political not even concerning human rights every activist organization uh, any form of activity is destroyed in uh, in Belarus and is prosecuted, which is also very um, very challenging for people. But on the other hand, uh, to finish my thought, uh, in the handbook I wrote uh, about problems with organizing the diaspora. I must say that this year brought some. Some stability to this situation. I wouldn't say that diaspora is uh, organized uh, as it could have been probably, uh, but coming times, uh, coming to terms with reality, it is stabilized and it is working really efficiently uh, for the state in which it is. Uh, so that's that's also very valid thing to say, uh, I think. Great. Well, th thanks for all of these all of these thoughts. I, I mean, for sure, through the school of transnational activism and, and European alternatives, we'll continue to engage in any way that we that we can and do and do more on this subject because there's. there's uh, the, the, there's the need, but there's, uh, as you kind of mentioned, there's also the danger that people forget about it. It goes off the front of the, it goes off the front of the news, and then it's as if it's not existing anymore. But of course, the situation is still, is still there, and there are people, still people uh, uh, fighting the good cause. Soren, I want to, I want to come to you next, Soren Brandes. Um, you're also someone who, who for, who for several years has been involved in. Uh, different forms of activism and in your contribution to the to the handbook um, it's quite a personal story about your putting yourself in the position of responsibility of being a facilitator or an organizer uh, for activists um, and I mean I find your text really valuable because you're you're open about the uh, fears and vulnerabilities of being in that situation so it would be great to hear uh, from you um, a little bit of that experience, but perhaps in particular how uh, support or advice from others uh, 
you know that you might have received but the handbook might give to others could could help people uh take that responsibility uh, and take that risk to act as a as a as an activist leader in a way so soren please yeah let me see so um since most people will probably not have read the, the contribution yet um um, so I write about a training that I did last year um, in October of 2020, um, so right before the US elections, and I did it with a group of American uh, like organizers from the US, especially from rural America, like really multiracial working class group of people and a group of people from Europe as well. And um, I write a bit about like the the fears that I had to face in doing the training and like the the feelings that I had ahead of the trainings, which were so I was very fearful um, facing this group of people, um, most of which I didn't didn't know before. And I had been invited to do the training by an organizer from the US um, from People's Action, which is one of the biggest networks of community organizing in the US. And um, and um, I was very afraid because I felt that I would not have to, um, or like I was, I was afraid that I wouldn't wouldn't be able to um, to really say something to these people because I knew that um, they were really deep in in the struggle and they had like exper experiences that I didn't have with, I don't know, growing up black like, in rural America, for example. And I felt like, so I'm just this white dude from West Germany. So like, what do we have in common? And um, usually what happened to me before I was uh, kind of engaged in these uh, community organizing circles, a lot of the time, whenever I faced these fears of like speaking in front of a group, training a group of people, um, people would just be like, okay, well, don't worry, you can do it, you know? Um, but as organizers, um, we do it a bit differently be because we actually want to um, have people work through their fears. And so um, the guy who led the training, Nigel Tan, asked me like, okay, so why do you want to do it? Like, you're really afraid. So what? why the fuck do you want to do it? And then, um, and that really got me, got me, um, like in my fields about the fact that I really do want to and need to, um, yeah, organize transnationally. And like, I really need to believe that, um, that all of us in this training have something in common. And actually the very fact that I was having these fears, which is like, has a lot to do with, um, my uh, my childhood and my upbringing, which in turn has a lot to do with um, the the way that neoliberal globalism or not globalism globalization um, works in Germany and has affected um, my childhood and my parents through the introduction of um, of the German welfare system as it was like uh, reformed in the early 2000s. And so, and that actually originally led me to transnational activism in the first place. And now I was there and like, I could feel that all of this was coming to me, uh, back to me. And that also like just put me back on, on this, into this position of like, yeah, I need to do this. I need to take this risk. And, you know, um, by knowing that I was afraid, I also knew that I was um, brave. In a way, you know, like if you don't have any fears, then you don't know that you're brave. And um, even though, um, you know, I'm not facing any um, immediate uh, like state oppression, um, like you do, Nikita, for example, like still, you know, like it takes a lot of um, braveness to stand in front of a group of people and, you know, lead, try to lead them towards something that I believe in. And actually, as it turned out, like I spoke about these experiences and I spoke about um, my um, childhood experiences and that actually did make it possible for all of us to connect in this space. Like, and it was not true as I had thought before that like we don't share anything in common but actually we do share so much in common. And um, 
Yeah, and that's been, I think, most some like one of the most re rewarding aspects for me in, in the organizing that I've done in the past years, which was mostly in transnational spaces. It's like always this feeling of, okay, so there's this person, uh, maybe just to, to, to name one example, like recently um, I connected with an organizer also from the US, but who had grown up in China. Um, and, um, and we spoke about our upbringing and um, there was a moment when like she spoke about the way that the Great Leap Forward in China had affected her like family history and the ways in which like the hunger that they had faced and the state oppression that they had faced like was embedded in her family history and the way that it had, have, had affected her. And it just made me think about like, so like one of the stories that I have connected to in the past years um, is the story of my grandparents who were um, refugees from the German East. Um, when like as children, um, they had to flee um, the Russian army and um, there were moments when they were disconnected from their parents and um, like really were facing immediate extinction in a way. And you know, and I've spent so much work on like trying to do, to uncover what that did to my family and like the intergenerational um, trauma that is embedded in my family because of this history of war um, and hunger that is also in my family, you know? And again, that is one of the reasons why I'm a transnational organizer because I don't want war to happen again. And like through these stories, like, and that was a moment for, for me and this, um, Chinese American organizer where we really connected, where we really felt like, okay, we like I know what you're talking about and you know what I'm talking about, even those, even though those things are very, very different stories and very different experiences. But like because we're all human, um, they do affect us in in similar ways. I guess. I guess that's what my what my contribution is about. And I think there was another part to your question that I just forgot. Um no, I mean, you touched on it. The other aspect was who helped you and how. <laughs> and you, you touched on it with, with, yeah. with the story of the other trainer who was kind of uh, prompting you to pose yourself these questions. Um, so, I mean, you answered, you answered me. <laughs> That's the good news. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, maybe the general point about that is that organizing is hard. And we... Um, and like it includes being challenged constantly and being out of your comfort comfort zone uh, constantly, but that is what we, what makes us grow. And so, like as organizers in a community of organizers, as comrades, um, we are responsible for each other's growth, and not for only let's say each other's well-being. If that makes sense, so. Like what you what what happens a lot of the time in um, progressive circles is that everyone is trying to take care of each other, um, but that just embeds us in um, in our oppression in many ways. So like because our oppression has um, has affected us and like dictates a lot of the ways in which we act in the world. Um, like we should not stay the same people that we had been before entering this space in a way, because that is like our oppressed selves. Um, and if we wanna end oppression, we also have to fight our own oppression. And that's what we do with each other, you know? Yeah. Good, I, this is a really powerful message for um, the launch of a handbook for transnational activists. So um, that, that's great. Uh, Tommaso, I want to I want to come to you on a slightly different level again of 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 concern because you have written about the um, colonial origins of of some part of the European Union or one way of thinking about the European Union, and you've you've written about this at a moment when um, over the past couple of years anti-racist struggles have become much more visible um, in the public sphere, anti-racism, anti-colonialism. But um, it's, it's pretty obvious still that um, we, still, we still have in the, in the privileged West 
highly colonial ways of thinking about the rest of the world. You just have to look at the, the vaccine distribution um, and the imbalances in it uh, to realize that uh, we're a long way from getting out of these um, colonial representations. So um, I, wanted, I, want, I want to ask you, you know, why is it important to uh, reconsider the history of the European Union today and what alternatives might that open up for thinking about the future of Europe? It's a big question, but you've got yes, maybe, five or six maybe, minutes, let's say, to give a flavour so that people read your article. I, 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 I will say thank you for the estimate, but I think uh, I will deceive you because in 10 minutes to answer that would be almost impossible, but I will do my best. You know? uh, so yes, I, I agree with you, there are still... Uh, a lot of things that are working as during the colonial period, also if a new config, com, configuration of, of power, but uh, there is no what uh, the specialist called coloniality is still going on. Uh, and we can see it also on the issue of the, of the vaccine, of course. Uh, what, why, why I wrote the, this paper, why it is interesting? It is interesting because it, it shows uh, a very specific criticism directed towards, not only towards the, uh, a certain way to imagine the European integration, but also towards a certain way to imagine decolonization. So we are used to imagine that nationalism and decolonization go together. The only way to decolonize is to create a national state. And this is a very powerful narrative. I, I'm a professor of political thought for colonization, decolonization, my field of studies. I have a lot of problem to face this issue because people told me, you are a colonialist. If you say no, that, uh, that you can criticize this association. So I, I, was, I was happy to see that like one year ago, uh, Hamid Abash is one of the best uh, scholar in this field, there's a pupil of Edward Said, a teacher at Columbia University, he wrote a book called The Emperor is Naked on the Inevitable Demise of National State, in which he denunciated this thing. He said, look, that the national state is a product of colonialism. And what we have nowadays is the myth of the national state that is a form of inheritance, of legacy that came from that. And he, he in this book that is mainly centered on the Middle East, but he is focused on the failure of the system in create a united polity. And also the bad consequences of that on the contemporary politics in that area. So I go back to a kind of alternative who was imagined in the 50s to the idea of a neo-colonial politics directed towards the, the at the time, the, the first uh, uh, communities of of the United Europe, it was not the European Union, but not the, the community for the, for the uh, carbon and, um, and still coal, tech, coal, coal and steel community. And then uh, later the, the, econo the, the economic uh, uh, European community. But at the time, no, there was this idea that, that this process that was a, a, a European integration could be accompanied by a new kind of colonialism, a form of neocolonialism directed towards Africa. So there was a discourse on Africa that was directed towards that. And against the discourse, there was a discourse of a different kind of Africa, imagined as a decolonial one, in which European and, and African citizens would be part of the same federal and trans-Mediterranean community. And I wrote especially about Albert Camus, uh, Leopold Senghor, who in different way insisted on that. They imagined a polity in which the center was not in Europe. Just Camus imagined that you know, the capital of this new union would be in Algeria, to give you one example. No? And Senghor said that the, uh, the same name of Union Francaise at that time, you know, there was a debate on how to reform the Union Francaise. He said, well, first thing, eliminate Francaise. <laughs> no, union, huh? and imagine a union that unified Europe and Africa, in which there was absolutely parity. Why this issue was so important? First, for a cultural reason. So to have an exchange between the two sides, not to cut the borders. And 
having an exchange for these two authors means that Europe would be influenced by Africa and not vice versa. So there was a lot of accent on this by both of them. Second fundamental point that was absolutely avoided by the, the colonial, anti-colonial debate at the time, the issue, the economic issue to create a new sort of federal link between the old imperial center and the new decolonized states with a federation would mean the opportunity to have transfer of money controlled democratically. So to avoid what happened later with neocolonialism, it was, it was foreseen by this, by this author that understood this risk. And of course, they were defeated politically in this attempt to not cut the link between the two shores of the Mediterranean, but to change the kind of link and to create a new form of transnational federal democratic polity. So why, and I'm going to your question, then I close, why all this is, is relevant today? Because we are living in a world who was created by this bad kind of decolonization, national one, in which there is the absence of unity, of political unity, of political, the ability to, to manage the society and to create equality, especially on the southern shore of the Mediterranean. And there is neocolonialism, of course. So how to solve this? Recurring again to national solution? I think no. I think that we have to go back to the one who were defeated, to Camus, Senghor, and others, they're not the only one, and to try to imagine in the new context, of course, not just following what they say, but in our context, new way to reunite the two shores of the Mediterranean Sea to a democratic and federal asset and to have the possibility to move money and resources to one side, to the other side of the Mediterranean, not as it was done at the time of the you no know, uh, Mediterranean partnership of the Union pour la Méditerranée at the time of Sarkozy. There was also there a form of, of course, of neocolonialism, but but to find a way to do it in an equalitarian way with institutions that are really democratic. So they represent the citizens, not only the national states. I think this is a challenge, but it's a very fundamental one if you want to face the issue of migration, of course, that founds a limit in the issue of borders. It's impossible to solve the issue of migration without facing the issue of borders. For that reason also, I launched a project with a dictionary of migration and borders with uh, Agora Europe. We are working on that project. You not know, try to put in together activists and scholars to, to have a broad picture about that, and the lexicon we use all around the world on this issue, because this is the, the, the central one, if you want to try to create a new solution, also to the issue of migration that nowadays on the Mediterranean is of course one of the most relevant. So I hope to, that, I, that I give you a, a first answer at least, and that's all. You did it. You did a great job, Tommaso. But I had no doubt that you would uh, faced with a with a tough with a tough question. And in addition to Tommaso's article that people can find online, there's there's articles specifically about migrant rescue as well, which uh, which is very much connected as Tommaso also uh, indicated. Look, we could speak, uh, you know, for hours about any one of the topics that have been touched on today, because there's, so, there's such a diversity and such a richness. I want to um, see whether uh, people who are listening to us might have any questions. They can either uh, write them down or, 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 or potentially raise their hands. I'm not too sure how, how it works. It may be safest to try to write them down. Um, but I, I want to ask a common question um, to everybody um, while, while we see if there, if there are questions that come through the chat. And that question is, is this, actually. Um, as I said at the beginning, the handbook is, is a living experimental project. Um, and so based on the thoughts that have been going through your head uh, this evening as you listen to everybody, what would you say are crucial topics uh, for us to approach um through the through the uh through the coming months crucial um yeah difficulties for for activists that have been highlighted or that came to your mind um 
yeah, crucial, crucial subjects that, that might need to be that might need to be addressed. So I think that, that that's the general question to everybody. Uh, to give you two minutes to think about it, I will I will take advantage of it. Tomasa wanting to ask a question to Enika. We'll hear that exchange and then we'll do the um, everybody think it's making their suggestions. So Tomasa, go ahead. Yeah, oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Enigo, for, for your intervention. I, I, I followed it with, with interest. But some questions arise, arise to me, and I think they would be useful for, for everyone maybe to, to enter also more critical inside this issue of the housing that you rightly uh, stressed. You, you, you spoke about the role of the European Union, you know? You spoke about austerity. The, one problem we have nowadays, according to me, with the European Union, at least nowadays, the European Union is uh, in a very also in intelligent way, but also smart, in, in, if we see from another side, using no more the austerity politics, by using the new next generation EU. You know? In Romania, arrives 29.2 billion of euro, directed also to social resilience. So, the point, uh, uh, my question is, this money are used together with a new legis legislation that implements forms of neoliberalism in the housing, question mark, or, or just the, the, the chapter related to the housing in Romania is not part of this plan, it was abandoned to itself following the old politics. Because I, I, I think that a fundamental point is no more to use the language of you know, the criticism towards austerity with this plan, because it's, we will uh, be out of touch with this reality that brings money, but not because it brings money is less dangerous. The point is brings money and ask for something. You know? And in this something that they ask in change of this money is the danger. But we cannot call this austerity, I think. Mm. No, I this think is my, my, my little impression. So uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Tommaso. Um, indeed, uh, I, I did not spend uh, enough thoughts on what I mean by austerity or to make a distinction in the different between different periods of times, right? In the um, in the history of the European Union, which uh, and I agree very much with your critical approach to how is that was created. Um, my, my, my criticism towards it is how it was created actually as, a, uh, as an economic union, and that was the primordial um, aim of it, beyond, you know, um, the, um, keeping peace and so on and so forth, which, well, okay, it's, um, we are beyond that. Um, and and that, that model of, uh, of the economic union actually um, when, for example, um, former Eastern European states entered into the Union, was already about neoliberal policies. It was already about uh, fiscal surveillance. It was already about controlling public deficit, uh, controlling uh, uh, debt, public debt. Uh, so I was referring to that period of time, actually and to how, how the 2008 crisis was uh, sought to be sought by, by these austerity measures, which in Romania, for example, was used to re-strengthen, re okay, sorry, uh, the, um, what they called the reform of the state. So the withdrawal of the state from you know, it's, it's social roles, privatization of uh, what left not privatized before 2008, 2009. So I was referring to that period of time. <clears throat> and what you are asking, I, I understood, I don't know if I understood well, it's about what, what is happening now, yeah, with the whole uh, um, yeah. program, yes, exactly what is European now. money comes to. Yes. Hmm? So that's a different period of Hmm? It's it's a bit early to say. I think is is the, is oh, yeah, yeah, the I mean, response. It it is it is so seemingly it's a different stage, 
Um, but we need to, yeah, we need to be aware how it continues to form a, uh, form a new policies. Um, now, what we saw during pandemic was that uh, this economic crisis was sought to be solved by um, um, putting into brackets, so to speak, the fiscal surveillance measures. So we could go beyond the public deficit, we could go beyond the, this kind of the public debt um, standards. Uh, nevertheless, how the state understood to use the state aid, maybe it was, I mean, I think it was very different in different um, countries. In Romania, we, have, we are having uh, during these times uh, a very strong neoliberal government. And they define state aid for the benefit of the capital, actually. So economic recovery, uh, in their understanding, means to uh, you know support, um, give support to private companies, right? Um, what happens with the money that is coming? Part of it, very big, big part of it, it's coming in the form of. Uh, of credits, of loans, right? What's the danger in this? It's that um, it will increase the public debt. And if uh, the EU will return to severe control about the public debt, you know, we have that limit of, I don't know, if you go over 55%, um, if the debt, public debt goes over 55% of GDP, then the state is enforced in a way by the means of mass treaty to and and uh, later economic measures to cut uh, social spending. So we go back to austerity measures. So. <laughs> Maybe. Good. I, I the I want to make the link with with the, with the question that I asked because one area that I'm aware that we are a little bit. Uh, Weaken, and we need we need more contributions to the handbook. Is precisely on um, international economic issues, which, as, as I mean, has always been obviously very important for uh, for politics in each of our countries. But over the past fifteen years, has been uh, particularly central. And as Tomaso was gesturing towards, there is a widespread vocabulary that has now developed. Uh, on the left, shall we say, uh, to try to critique uh, neoliberalism. And so we talk about austerity and, and cuts and so on, but it's by no means clear that we're still in that world. Uh, and, and we need to develop a new way of talking about these issues pretty quickly if we're to catch up with what has happened in it. So that's one uh, area where the handbook really needs to uh, solicit some contributions. I want to go around and quickly hear what ideas you've come up with, and I suggest we go in the same order that we spoke in to begin with. So, Antje. Yes, thank you, and, and thanks so much, everybody, for the contributions. I, it is a shame that we can't get together and, and continue to discuss uh, these different issues in, in more detail. Um, so, I will try to be actually very precise because uh, um, there's something I have in mind that actually speaks to some of the issues that uh, have been mentioned. And um, in particular, the question um, that arose in conversation between Iniko and, and Nicolo earlier, um, which was the question, sometimes it's not clear who's actually responsible, who should we actually address uh, if we, when we want to act across borders. And, and of course, uh, in, uh, kind of what comes to mind uh, in Europe, one of the first actors to address is the European Union, but like Iniko was, was rightfully uh, pointing out, um, there's questions there as to whether you would want to do that and what effect that would have uh, and, and the problems that the European Union has, uh, which are manifold, which I'm not going to get into. So I'm going to mention instead uh, what I thought was uh, in my research, what I found particularly hopeful, which is that uh, very interestingly, 
when we talk about transnational activism, a lot of the activists I work with and spoke to, um, like myself, saw a lot of hope, not necessarily on the EU level or on the national level, but indeed on the local and municipal level, where again, a lot of the issues that we discussed, including migration, including uh, deaths in the Mediterranean, including um, housing, are, are felt in a very pressing way. Um, and but where you also have um, the opportunity to implement quite radical alternatives. And I'm thinking in particular of the municipal movement parties that have emerged in Europe in the aftermath of the 2010 mobilizations, uh, notably in Spain and Italy, but also all across um, Europe and including Eastern Europe, including even the UK, and uh, indeed across the world. And uh, there is already efforts uh, of radical mayors, municipal movement parties, radical municipal movements, which have existed. Again, we can go back and maybe this is a, a plug of something that I'm certainly continuing to explore in my work. And I think that may be interesting for the school to continue to explore is how such uh, local actors and, and radical municipalities and mayors have worked together already in the past to change transnational policies and to enact change uh, on a transnational level, not just on the local level. Um, and I personally, I draw a lot of hope from that because it can lead to quite concrete proposals uh, such as redistributing European funds to cities willing to take newcomers, uh, which is a practice that at the that get, gets discussed a lot in the circles of European alternatives, but that unfortunately deserves much greater attention, I think, uh, when we talk about radical alternatives in Europe that could theoretically be implemented quite soon if there was the political will to do so. Thank you. Thanks very much for those suggestions. Uh, Eniko, what would your suggestions be for new topics? Well, first, uh, first, I very much appreciate this idea to have um, uh, a handbook that is uh, planned from the beginning to be a process, because uh, indeed um, we cannot say that this is the handbook forever. But like uh, uh, essentialize it as a as a universal tool or whatever. Uh, well, 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 I don't know. So um, maybe for you, it could be possible to identify more uh, grassroots movements, uh, which are maybe invisible at EU level, because, you know, some movements do have more, more uh, resources to become visible. And I'm sure that there's several uh, 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 local level grassroots movements uh, uh, that would, um, hmm, would would need you know to be recognized as such. Uh, okay, so this yeah maybe this could be a could could, could be a um, a chapter to to think about. Uh, then I maybe it would be great to. Hmm, I don't know, somewhere to create dialogue between different movements in terms of their uh, domain of activity. So how environmental movements, so in a way this could connect, you know, environmental movements to housing movements, to workers' rights movements, to feminist movements, to LGBT movements, you know. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, because I'm sure that there are initiatives, you know, to connect, but to think even conceptually, <laughs> about the potential, the, the potential to refer to each other and to be ready to think through each other. You know, different things. Uh, because in this way you can you can transcend more, you know, this potential to address um, the systemic uh, the systemic problems which are not only here, there, and there, but they are all over. Okay, then um yeah, I don't know. Um, maybe this order division to refer to movements for civic and political rights, to movements for uh, cultural rights, and to movements for social economic rights could be maybe useful to, to think about. Um, because, yes, we see, and then Nikita 
Nikita's uh, experiences and and uh, and, and uh, political traumas, uh, what are happening in a totalitarian state, reminds us, yes, that uh, <clears throat> uh, it is a lot to fight for political rights and freedoms and fundamental liberties. And on the other hand, you know, there is a lot to fight for social economic rights and equality and justice. Uh, and, and sometimes I see in Romania, and then and then, then we have the identity politics movements for, for cultural rights and recognition. So in Romania, for example, I, I see that um, they are ruptures between these movements, and maybe at the transnational level it would be great to connect them and to to say it's not one or the other or the, or the other. The, it should be a cooperation in order to imagine uh, uh, another world that of equality and justice for all. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks for this, Eniko. Nikita. Yeah, unfortunately, I tend to think in general terms. So uh, I think that one of the paths that maybe this handbook can go is what I call um, 21st society facing 20 century state because all of all of we are talking here uh, is also about introducing and forcing the state to to accept what we want it to accept and when we talk when we talk uh, about um, colonialism or capitalism I would say that to some extent these are Western terms mm, and I as a person who lives for 20 years or more, more than 20 years in Poland in Warsaw also tend to think in those categories but when I'm faced with the other world that I'm in the Eastern European world uh, People there think in other categories. They are obviously familiar with with the capitalism, with the idea of capitalism and how Westerners understand it. But uh, I would like call it more generally, uh, as I said, 20th century state versus the 21st century society, and uh, how to force. Uh, the state to operate in our terms uh, or in our categories i think is one of the questions uh, that we as activists all over the world can ask ourselves excellent thanks thanks so much Sorum. um well so like one of the things that i was thinking about is just um how like a lot of the time in these uh, transnational spaces, um, I feel like we we tend to have like a really good analysis of what is going on a lot of the time and are really smart about big concepts. And um, what I'm missing sometimes is more concretion about just the like like what are the concrete things that we can do. Um, um, in terms of transnational activism. So like, what are examples that are happening right now um, or have been happening in the past of like where transnational activism solved like really concrete issues? What are very concrete targets um, that we want to address rather than, you know, capitalism in general or um, I don't know, the EU even in general. So like, where are the concrete um, ways that we can work together across borders where it actually really adds something to um, our local work. Um, and yeah, so like, for example, where are, are people in different countries he, who um, organize together against the same multinational company? No. Um, and yeah, I would really like to read more of these kinds of stories um, also to get um yeah ideas for our own organizing thanks uh tomaso so uh 
I, I so quickly, I will focus. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. So, so quickly, I, I, I will focus on the transnational imaginary. So, how to create a common transnational imaginary and which is the role who are playing on this issue, the arts in general, and more specifically certain of them, like, to give you an example, cartoons. I was impressed to see the role that cartoons played in the campaign in Berlin for the referendum on the uh, housing. So one fundamental uh, issue to solve if you want to get out of the national imaginary that is still there between us everywhere is to create a new kind of imaginary or, or at least to move out or aside from where we are and a very powerful instrument is the one of cartoons cartoons touch the emotion of people and it's a, a, a way to do politics that is is still now not so much used. It starts to be used. So I think there will be interesting an inquiry on that and try to understand the potential in that also in trying to, to move out from the national imaginary and to imagine new forms of arts and of, of cartoons that give to, uh, to the Europeans and also people out of Europe a new kind of common imaginary. I think it's, it's interesting and uh, uh, and, and that is the approach uh, is more relevant than what that one can seem. See, <laughs> you can think I'm crazy. No, I'm not so crazy. If you read the last, the, the very relevant book by uh, by Alai Sapiens, no, for me to go, he said that the very main characteristic, the essential characteristic of man is the ability to have a common imaginary. This distinguishes men from animals. And you can move millions of people if these people have a common imaginary. So I think that what we really miss so nowadays is a common imaginary. So to work on that, I think, will not be a bad idea. Great. Well, thanks, everybody, for all of these uh, suggestions. We've got plenty of work ahead of us at all different kinds of scales and uh, with different kinds of issues ranging from the most concrete concrete to um, the imaginary significations um, of, of our society. Um, we, uh, we, we, can, we can leave people to respond um, with their contact details if they want to in the chat. So I noticed that Amanda is asking for people's uh, contact details. So um, we'll keep the call open for a couple of minutes um, to allow anybody who wants to, to do that to do that. I wanted to congratulate us all on um, being very punctual. We said this meeting would go on until 9.30. It's 9.34. As you all know, uh, Oscar Wilde quipped that socialists wouldn't change the world because the meetings last too long. I think that it's a good sign for uh, the School of Transnational Activism that we managed to uh, hold meetings to, to time. Um, and it will encourage us to have more of them, more shorter meetings rather than fewer longer meetings. So um, with all of these good ideas that we've got in, in, in mind after this evening, I wanna congratulate everybody on their contributions. Thank everybody for attending. And as you see, uh, the sharing of emails is going on in the chat. So have a good evening, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>